Hello. Today I want to talk about Vera's jurisdictionally nested baseline system. Now this is the system that they're putting forward that they say is going to take over all baselines in 2025, and it's going to solve all of the issues that exist with Vera projects, if, if you're to believe them. Um, so I want to basically go through how it works, and then go through you know some problems that I've identified with it, and why it might not be a panacea for you know all of the woes that exist in the voluntary carbon market. So, quick disclaimer, I don't have as much information as I would like to make this video. All I have is the documents on Vera's website. And anyone who's read Vera documents know that they read like a dictionary. They're very difficult to actually interpret. So until I start seeing the system in, uh, in action, I'm not really going to know what people are going to be able to do, what, you know, what Vera is going to enforce, and what they're going to give passes for. So this is all a little bit supposition based on doing my best to interpret Vera documentation. Good evening, Mr. Rook. Good evening. Thank you. All right, so let's talk about how this works. Fundamentally, it's pretty simple. There is a two-step process. Uh, and the first step in this is calculating the deforestation rate for the jurisdiction. So, uh, you know, you've got a project inside the state of Acre in Brazil or inside of a whole country. What has to happen is you have to compute the, the basically the deforestation rate in that country. Now, how this is done is basically using land use land cover maps. So people are, are developing maps based on uh, deforestation rates over the last uh, handful of years and saying this is what the deforestation rate is inside that country. Um, once you have that number, let's say it's 2% per year, uh, this, is, this is the cap on the amount of credits that could be handed out to all the projects in that, in that state. And this is pretty good because it's, it's really important that we have an upper cap because right now you've got Vera projects claiming just outrageous amounts of deforestation was likely to happen inside of them. And states are, you know, if you add it all up to a state level, then there's way too many carbon credits being handed out. So this is, this is a maximum cap, and if you've got one project inside the state, then it can't, it can't get more credits than that cap. If you've got four projects inside the state, then you know, combined, they can't get more than that cap. Um, the second step is then to allocate uh, you know, the credits from that cap to the individual projects. So you've got a cap of 2% per year that equates to, I don't know, 6 million tons or something. Uh, then you have to hand out those 6 million tons to the projects inside that state. Uh, this works by creating risk maps. And these risk maps are basically just estimating where deforestation is going to happen over the next six years. Simple as that. Step one, compute deforestation rate, get your cap. Step two, predict where deforestation was going to happen, give out credits based on that. So uh, that, you know, that's the high level overview. But now I want to talk about why I think that there are a lot of problems with this, uh, this approach. You know, one of the first things that I want to talk about is that, you know, this is, this is not a fundamental like shift in thinking as you might be, you know, might be thinking. Uh, this is still, you know, a set of alternative scenarios that, you know, people are coming up with to say what deforestation was going to happen inside of a project. Right? So you're still just creating a map of where deforestation was going to take place over the next six years. That's all it is. Um, you know, the second point that I want to make is that this is not a dynamic baseline. And what I mean by dynamic is that uh, more and more people are starting to create baselines in which they're estimating what would have happened in the year 2022 based on data from the year 2022. And so each year the baseline is recalculated and updated. And this is really good if, for example, the president of Brazil gets kicked out of office and somebody more liberal comes in and stops deforestation. Uh, well, this, this is not dynamic. Um, this is a baseline that's updated every six years. So uh, right now, Vera has baselines that are updated every 10, supposedly, although they're not always. Uh, this new approach will have to, will make people update the baseline every six. So it's a step forward, but it's not as, you know, it's, it's not a live baseline as the, as the project goes. But, you know, I think fundamentally, when I'm talking about, when we're talking about remote sensing maps, we have to ask two different questions. Who's making the maps? And, you know, what is the methodology that they're following to make the maps? Now, on the first question, you know, who's making the maps? The answer here appears to be anybody. 
Uh, anybody is allowed to make the jurisdictional maps and anybody is allowed to make the risk maps for a state. Uh, essentially, you know, you can still have a project developer like South Pole coming up with their own maps that inexplicably don't agree with anybody else's. What's different than what's happened in the past is that when that map is submitted, it has to go through the state government of whatever state that you're in. So it has to be signed off on by the bureaucrat of the state. Um, so this, this is an extra level of check because, you know, state governments maybe don't have the same incentive structure as project developers. Um, but it's not ideal, right? The ideal would be like a genuine third party like NASA or the Servir program or USAID or the European Space Agency. These are the people who should be making the maps, but we have, we're not there yet. <laughs> but that's not how this system's going to work. But also, if there's more than one carbon project in the state, then everybody who's, you know, part of that needs to get together and agree what the map is going to be. Now, why does it matter who makes the maps? Well, you know, a lot of subtle biases can sneak into remote sensing maps if you let them. Uh, you know, you can have like subtle biases in the label data. Um, you can have uh, something akin to p-hacking, where, you know, you make like 20 different maps, you know, and, and the one that you submit is the one that gives you the most credits. This is the kind of thing that we want to avoid, and the best way to avoid that is to have an impartial body making the maps. This is an example of a, of a carbon project that's owned by the Cambodian government. The Cambodian government makes its own maps and claims that it's only been 6% deforested. So we've already got like plenty of corrupt states out there putting forward maps that inexplicably don't agree with, you know, the widespread scientific consensus. So I'm not happy with who's making the maps. But what I'm really not happy with is how the maps are being made. Now, the jurisdictional map, I, I think, is kind of OK. It's just looking at historical deforestation rates. Uh, there's not much there in terms of like teeth. Uh, but the risk map is extremely simplistic. Now, you're allowed to make a risk map in a bunch of different ways, but the official way that's proposed by Vera is just to put a buffer wherever deforestation happened last year. So basically, deforestation happened here last year, therefore, deforestation is likely to happen next door next year. It's as simple as that. Well, that is way too simplistic an approach to estimate where deforestation is going to happen in the future. I mean, this is 2023. We've got artificial intelligence, we've got CubeSats, we should be pretty good at predicting where deforestation is likely to occur. You know, there's some important variables that should be going into this. Things like accessibility and desirability and the amount of timber on the land. You know, the socioeconomic status of the landowners. All of this stuff is really important and just kind of being thrown away. So let's talk about what can go wrong when you use super simplistic risk maps. Let's say you do use the map that they recommend, which is just predicting where deforestation is going to occur next year based on where it happened last year. One good example of this going wrong would be potentially if you have a valley where people are deforesting uh, and, and the edges and the sides of the valley, they're, they're too steep. You can't convert that land to agriculture. Well, you know, under this scenario, if your valley is being deforested, then the mountains next door are the ones that are next. All of a sudden, they're going to be labeled high risk. Let's give another example. Uh, this is a project that's taking place in an area that's been completely deforested. So there's no more deforestation happening on this landscape, but obviously this last little bit of trees that remains needs to be protected. Under this scenario, be you know, because there hasn't been any deforestation around last year, this project gets nothing. <laughs> uh, let's look at another example. This is a project that, you know, is 50-50 swamp forest and upland forests. Now, people can't convert the swamp forest into agriculture. Th that forest exists below the water table most of the year, and, and it doesn't grow crops. And the trees that are there, they're not really worth any timber. So all the upland forest people have been deforesting, and the swamp forests have been completely untouched. Well, of course, if you use a risk map that basically just says anything next to the upland forest is going to be deforested, uh, you're going to get the wrong answer. So the, the system that Vera is proposing to map forest risk is, is wildly inappropriate. And it's, it's really going to result in some terrible outcomes. Um, but, you know, it could get worse than this. Because a clever project developer could look at the risk map and figure out where the highest perceived risk is, but the lowest actual risk is. And this actually happens in a lot of other protocols. So in the United States, for example, uh, we call this gerrymandering, where basically project developers are basically only enrolling the bits of the land that they couldn't have harvested. So maybe they're only enrolling the trees that are in steep ravines or the trees on small islands, the bits that they couldn't really get to or didn't really want. 
then they're clear cutting all the rest. Well, under this really simplistic risk map that's being made by the same group that's probably getting the credits, uh, guess what? I mean, you can just enroll the, the little steep ravines and the trees that really weren't at risk. So up until this point, most Vera projects have been pretty immune to gerrymandering because of how their baselines work. Uh, you know, this new baseline approach is going to be very susceptible to gerrymandering. But, you know, it, it could get even worse because you could envision genuinely manipulating these risk maps in a way that favors more credits. And let's walk through an example of how you could do that. About half of all uh, avoided deforestation projects today are being run by timber companies. Um, and, you know, they're not necessarily the fluffy, happy timber companies that you think about when you think about developing world timber companies. Uh, these are often bad guys. So, for example, the CEO of, of the timber company that owns this project is currently under indictment in Peru for smuggling mahogany out of the country. Uh, this timber company up and sold 1,700 hectares of the project area. Who cares if there's a project, right? Uh, and this timber company basically just harvested a bunch of trees on the project because why not? So these are the same people that we have to trust not to manipulate the risk map. But if they wanted to, what these timber companies could do is place some strategic clear cuts around their project each year and drive up the perceived risk on the risk map. So for example, this project is taking place in an area that's you know probably not a very high risk. You know, there's only this little bit off to the east by this highway that's, that's at any real risk. But because the whole area is, is owned by a timber company, they could just start placing a couple of small clear cuts around the project and all of a sudden the project would be getting 100% credits. So this is the kind of manipulations that we have to watch out for. And, and you know, a, a, an extremely simplistic risk map like this is really susceptible to. Now, what about leakage? Fans of this approach will sometimes say that, uh, you know, the jurisdictional nested baselines do away with leakage. We don't have to worry about it at all. Well, I, I don't think that's the case at, at all. I, I don't think it changes leakage in the slightest. For a project existing inside of a state, it has to compute leakage in the same way as ever. So, you know, you've got your whole leakage belt and you've got your deductions. Uh, for a project that is a state, um, all we're doing is making projects bigger. And so if you are enrolling the entire state of Texas, sure, you don't have to worry about leakage inside of Texas. You do have to worry about leakage in Oklahoma and Louisiana. So neighboring states are at just as big a risk as neighboring areas inside of other carbon projects. But I want to back up a little bit here because this is a new set of rules and one could argue may maybe Vera is turning over a new leaf and things are going to get better. I want to point out that, you know, one of the reasons that I'm so uh, cynical about this set of rules is that none of the other rules that Vera has in place are currently enforced. You know, Vera allows you to change your project area. It allows you to sell your land after you've already committed to protecting it. It allows you to harvest the trees on the land without FSC certification. It allows you to verify only bits of the project. It allows you to say how much deforestation has happened inside the project, even if it's completely opposite to everybody else's claims. You know, Vera is already letting people violate its rules on a regular basis. Is a new set of rules going to change anything? And, and, you know, this is why I'm not even going to go into, like, you know, more nuance into this protocol. I, you know, I could start talking about the buffer, for example, but to be honest, Vera's buffer system, I've only ever seen it used twice, and those are both cases in which, like, basically the numbers were run, done wrong instead of there being, like, a genuine reversal. Incredible cynicism but aside, let, what's the large-scale takeaway from this? Uh, definitely some of Vera's worst projects are going to get fewer credits, right? Be because, you know, you, you can't have the Caribas of the world getting tens of millions of tons if, you know, there's widespread, you know, agreement that deforestation rates in this jurisdiction are nowhere near that high. Um, but, you know, we could still very much end up in a situation where projects are getting way more credits than they should. I think it's also worth pointing out that this system does not fix Vera's past mistakes. Hundreds of millions of tons of credits have been issued wrongly you know, using Vera's current system, the one that they have right now. And this does nothing to fix that. So, yeah, sure, I mean, maybe Kariba will start receiving fewer credits, but they've still already received tens of millions of tons that they probably shouldn't have. And that's tens, if not hundreds of millions of tons of carbon that really should be dealt with, right? Because that's real CO2 that's gone into the atmosphere. So these projects, they're not going to dig themselves out of that hole. They're never going to be able to offset their offsets.
So, you know, as a way to finish things up, let's wrap up my own feelings on this protocol as it exists today. Uh, what are the pros? Uh, one pro is that it does put a constraint on the amount of credits you can claim. There is this state level constraint that says, this is how much deforestation is happening inside the state. You can't claim more than that. So it kind of does away with this idea that like all these little carbon projects were claiming that all the trees were going to get cut down. Uh, you know, another pro is that more people need to be involved in the calculations. So somebody, some bureaucrat at the state level does need to sign off on what the risk maps are and that state level cap. Uh, and presumably, uh, we will find out that some state level officials in the world are, are not corrupt. <laughs> but let's talk about the cons. You know, one quick uh, downside to this approach is that it's not dynamic. So the maps are, are recalculated every six years rather than every year. M one major downside to this is who makes the maps. Anybody can make the maps right now. They are not being made by peer-reviewed independent scientific organizations. NASA Severe, the ESA, uh, you know, the GLAD uh, lab. You know, you, we can name dozens of independent organizations that we could trust to make these maps. Uh, this, these maps instead could be made by the same set of characters who have been making them in the past. Um, the maps are overly simplistic. So at least the example provided by Vera that they encourage you to use is basically just saying deforestation is going to happen next year next to where it happened last year. And that is way too simplistic an approach. It's going to result in, you know, areas dramatically overstating their risk and areas dramatically understating their risk. So it's a, just a really bad way of predicting where deforestation is going to take place. Um, you know, the, the protocol is susceptible to gerrymandering. So we could start seeing project developers start drawing squiggly lines around just the areas that get them the most credits on the map. The protocol is also potentially uh, susceptible to kind of more sinister manipulations. So if you had the ability to place clear cuts on the ground, you could drive up the amount of credits that you get in areas next to those clear cuts. Uh, ultimately, until we start seeing some examples, I mean, who really knows? Uh, but I'm not wildly excited about this uh, protocol, and I, I don't think it's going to really solve much. Um, we're still going to have wild examples of people getting overcredited and sometimes undercredited. <laughs> it could happen. <laughs>